So what are the seven key deal points you need in your screenwriting contract? You smell that? What is that? What? What's that smell? A cologne? No. Opportunity. No, money. Oh, okay. I smell money. Okay. Chris? God damn it. Sorry. I'm gonna take you through one of my contracts, explain what the terms mean, and most importantly, give you the numbers you should be aiming for. Screenwriting contracts, let's get stuck in. Big disclaimer, in an ideal world, you should not be negotiating your own contract with a producer or a financier. You should have an agent, an attorney, or a manager on your deal. But we're not in an ideal world. Writers are going out there, they're marketing their material on online platforms, they're finding buyers, they're getting sniffles of interest, and the producers are putting pieces of paper in front of them and saying, right, let's do a deal. And if you can't get a representative, the minimum you can do is be educated about what you need to have in your contract. And I hope to give you some information here which will help you when you get in that situation. So how many people have you talked to about this trade? A few. There's definitely some interest. Oh, my boss would have my ass. And I'm crazy, That's Jerry. Not get lost, Jerry. Fuck you. Seven key terms that you need in your contract. Number one, the big number. The blue sky number. The number that you get if the movie gets made. So often this is referred to as the purchase price or the principal photography payment, which is the money that you get on the first day of principal photography or the exercise price. They, all these terms are interchangeable and they, there are little differences, but essentially it's the big money. So what should you get if your magnus opus actually makes it to the big screen? Simple piece of arithmetic. Two and a half percent of the budget to three percent of the budget. So if the movie costs $10 million, you should get $250,000. If the movie costs $20 million, hopefully you'll get half a million dollars or near that. But does that mean if the movie costs $100 million, you should get two and a half million dollars? Well, my friend, only if you're very fortunate and your script gets sucked into a bidding war in that you have more than one person who wants to take it. Most scripts have a floor payment and a ceiling payment. So for instance, in this, it had the floor, which was $350,000, which is the minimum that my co-writer and I would have got if this movie had got made, and the ceiling, which was 650. Two and a half percent, and you're going sliding up, and then you hit 26 million, and it doesn't matter if it's 26 million or 100 million, you're topping out at 650, which is a huge sum of money. So you're offering us a chance to short this pile of blocks? How? In terms of your negotiation, the figure that I would suggest you focus on is the floor payment. Because even if the movie costs a lot more than it actually they're owning up to, you know, you know that you will get that figure. And it's a bit like that Michael Clayton movie poster, the truth can be adjusted, well so can the budget, and so can the net profits. This is Hollywood accounting. Somewhere along the line, these B's and double B's went from a little risky to dog shit. Where's the trash? I'm behind you. I'm talking rock bottom. Make sure you nail down a really decent floor payment. And here's a little trick that will help you in your negotiation. Ask the producer who wants to make your movie, well, what kind of budget are we talking here? And producers will often not want to look cheap and they'll say, oh, well, $10 million. Yeah. And then you go, great, I'll have a floor of 250. And they'll say, oh, no, no, well, we might want to make it for five. And then you say, well, I'm not sure I want this film made at five. Now, obviously the economics are very different in the sub one million dollar, you know, price range. But the arithmetic still holds good that if a movie costs a million dollars, you should get two and a half percent of the budget. I mean, the story is the most important thing, right? So is it, is it greedy to ask for two and a half percent of the budget? No, it's not. You're completely sure of the math. I have signed 35 of these and only once did I sign up for a 2% of the, the budget payment sliding scale and that was on a low budget horror. The second number is the option payment. The way that an option works is a producer has the right, exclusive right, to shop your material. No one else can make it, but not the obligation to make the film. So it's like a car lease agreement. They will lease the car off you for 12 months. They'll put on a whole load of mileage. They might put a couple of dents on it because once a script has been shopped, it can lose some value because it's not shiny new anymore. And at the end of the 12 month lease period or option period, they may decide to hand you back the keys or they may decide, look, I'll have it for another year, see if I can get it made. Option payments used to be very standard in non-competitive situations, but you know, this one I think is $10,000.
but those payments have come under a lot of pressure recently. And sometimes producers will not offer you any money as an option. No income verification. Adjustable rates, dog shit. This is one of the only ways you can earn money if a film's not gonna get made. The other one is clause three, which is the rewrite fee. There's two components to this, which I want you to, to focus on, not just the money, but also the right to rewrite. Very important. So that if your producer sets up the project and attaches a director, which has happened to me, you're in a position whereby you're guaranteed the rewrite. You don't have a situation where, oh yeah, big director wants to come on board, but they've never worked with you, they wanna bring in their writer. You're gonna to have to step aside, sorry mate. Now if you put it in the paper, they have to go through you and give you at least a step. The fourth clause that you need, a credit clause. If you're in the WGA, the WGA have a great system. It's not perfect, but it's the best system we've got. But in the indie world, who's gonna decide who gets the credits? And it's very important because the producers have skin in the game here, or the financiers, because the one thing you need to know about credit is credits are money. It's not just about being able to say, oh, I wrote that it's being able to collect the money on it because most of these contracts have a clause of death, as I call it, which means that if you share credit, you lose half your money. How come nobody's talking about this? The fifth clause that you need, passive payments, which are great if you can get them, which means the movie's already got made and they make a sequel or a spin-off or a remake. So the usual computation is that you should get 50% of what you got for the first one, for the second or the third, even if you don't work on it. And for a remake, 33.3% of what you originally got. And this is a minimum, obviously you can negotiate upwards. If you've got juice, you will make sure that you get first refusal to write the sequel. But make sure you have your passive payments nailed down. The sixth clause is not so much a clause that you want, they'll give it to you quite easily which is you get anything between two and a half and 5% of the net profits of the movie. Well, this is a public advisory in case you hadn't heard. These movies don't make profits. Most movies are completely, it's all about Hollywood accounting. For instance, 2005, Scott Derrickson, director and writer of The Exorcism of Emily Rose. That movie cost 19 million and grossed 150 worldwide. Guess how much it made in terms of its net profits. Take a guess. I don't know, you tell me. How much did Scott Derrickson get for being the writer and director of this fantastically profitable movie? Zero. And he got zero because under the definition of net profits, these movies never go into profits. <clears throat> Nobody knows what's in them. Nobody knows what's in the bonds. I've seen some that are 65% triple-A rated. Subprime shit with FICOs below 550. Get the fuck out of here. You want me to really blow your mind? Yeah, I think it was Harry Potter. Somebody leaked the profit and loss statement of that to Hollywood deadline in 2011. That movie grossed almost a billion dollars. And yet, if you look at the profit and loss, amount paid out to profit participants, zero, because they cooked the books. A studio like Warner Brothers is distributing, its distribution arm will charge the film a distribution fee plus a profit and that will come off the budget and, and it will stop you earning out. Warren, you're the first person who has found this thing. Hold on, So mortgage bonds are dog shit. CDOs are dog shit wrapped in cat shit. Yeah, that's right. Never, ever, ever work for net. It's no money, it's never money. Upfront is everything. So your option payment, your rewrite payment, uh, those are the payments that you want to focus on. Because in this business, a bird in the hand is worth a whole species in the never, never bush. The seventh clause, which is really important, the reversion clause, which is what happens to your drafts if the film doesn't get made. So I've signed 35 contracts, and of those, only six have been collected on. I bet your margins are pretty nice and fat. Let's not talk about my margins, by the way. Being nice and fat, that's a nice shirt. Do they make it for men? The most likely scenario of any deal that you do, and this is what you need to think, it's great that you do the deal or you get a producer interested. The first thing that you should be thinking, what happens to my work if it doesn't get made? And this is why you have a reversion clause. You don't just get your original draft, you get all the rewrites. And this is so important. I can't tell you how important it is 
that you get this stuff back. And what calculation should you use? You will pay back the producer any writing money that you've been paid. They'll get back on first day of principal photography if the movie gets made. They don't get anything if the movie doesn't get made. The money they've invested in the script. Make sure they're not charging other stuff in there. Make sure when they took that plane to Cannes, that's not included. Um, because otherwise you're going to get a huge turnaround cost or reversion cost. And make sure also they're not getting their option money back. They don't deserve to get that money back. They've already had the benefit of that option money. So in this script, you'll see that the first and second option payments are not included in the reversion clause. Make sure you've got that. So there are many clauses that you need in a contract. These contracts run to 30, 40 pages. I am skimming the surface. But make sure that you've locked down your 2.5% big number. Make sure that if they are going to go into an option agreement, you're getting as much as possible because up front is everything. Rewrite. Yeah, the money's important, but even more important is that you've got a guaranteed step so you can't get booted off. Um, number four, the credits. My goodness, you've got to lock that down, especially in the wild west of the indie world. Otherwise, not only are you going to lose the kudos of being credited for your work, you also could lose a lot of money. Passive payments. Nobody should be arguing about passive payments. If your film is a success and there's a sequel, a prequel, or a remake, you should be getting passive payments. Make sure you're not uh, wowed by big figures on the net profits. Somebody offers you 90% of the net profits. It's 90% most likely of nothing. Never work for net. Upfront is everything. Okay? And then the seventh clause, make sure that you don't lose creative or copyright to any rewrites, and they come back to you in the event of a movie not getting made. Triple Bs, zero. And then that happens. What is that? That's America's housing market. Thank you. Fucking hey, Jared. Shut your fucking mouth. And finally, keep an eye on the difference between potential earnings and reality earnings. So this contract here potentially could have earned my writing partner and I $650,000 if it had cost more than $26 million, which it would have done because it was a massive movie. The reality, we got paid $10,000 for the first year option. There wasn't a rewrite. So $10,000 was the reality of signing this $650,000 potential earning contract. And bear in mind, we didn't get $5,000 each. We had to pay 10% to the agent, 5% to the attorney, which by the way, that money is well spent if you get a good attorney. Sometimes we have to negotiate our own deals. But if you can get a decent attorney, oh man, well they earn you 5% back. Ditto for an agent. Sometimes I've had a manager as well, so you're losing 25% off the top. So your $10,000 is actually $7,500. And if you're a writing partner, you've got to split that two ways. So you're looking at $3,750, which is not a huge amount of money on a project that could have earned you $650,000. They call me Chicken Little. They call me Bubble Boy. So if this content has been of use to you, stay tuned because I'm going to do more videos in this space. So consider subscribing. And in the next video, I'm going to provide some advice on how to negotiate your own deal, give you some tactics and tips on how to maximize your revenue and get the best deal possible. This is Scriptfella. Catch you in the next vid. Out.